So, hello everyone. Uh, in case you've forgotten from this morning, I'm Martin Robinson. And um, I want to talk a little bit about something we've been working on at Igalia, which is implementing native accessibility support for Chromium on Linux. And as I was thinking about this talk, I was thinking like, oh, there are a lot of like really like detailed things about this work that are probably not interesting to anyone at all, except people working on it. So I thought I'd give like a more basic introductory talk, which I, I'm sure this will be uh, old material for a lot of you, but I thought it might be more interesting to a wider audience than nitpicky details about desktop Linux stuff. Um, but essentially, I just want to talk a little bit about what it's like uh, to implement accessibility uh, in a web browser, um, uh, which which is basically the the bit that connects like all of the accessibility code in, in the web browser to the platform APIs, um, and also to kind of explain. I, mean, I think sometimes as as web implementers, if we're not familiar with the accessibility code, we run into it because it's like something is 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 slow or it's crashing. And we don't really know like why it's doing that. Um, so I thought maybe this talk might help a little bit to understand a bit more like why these kind of issues come up. Um, but to begin, I thought it might be interesting, although I'm sure it's not necessary to motivate a bit uh, accessibility because um, um, maybe a lot of us haven't hadn't had a chance to think very deeply about it. So. Um, Essentially, like why why accessibility? Um, and I think the first and ob most obvious thing is that more and more the web is is like a public space that we all have to use to interact in daily life. And the idea that some people would be excluded from the web is um, is just unjust to think about that. Um, and I'm sure maybe some of you have had a, a little bit of what this experience is like if you, for instance join a new group, uh, there's a bit of an echo, but I think it's fine if I talk a bit more quietly. Join a new group and uh, they only announce their events on a certain social network that you're not a part of. Like that's an example of what it's like to be excluded, a very small slice. Um, or maybe in your life you've used the web to to avoid, uh, even if there's an alternative, the web is just way more convenient to use. Maybe you can avoid standing in long queues at bureaucratic offices or like even get food more quickly. And the idea that somehow like people with a different set of abilities can't use these shortcuts or these, uh, frankly, convenient ways of doing things is, is just obviously unjust. So I think this is like the most <laughs> obvious reason why accessibility is important, but if you're still not convinced, um, you should know that accessibility is useful for everybody. Um, it's not just the people that you imagine in your head when you think about accessibility. Um, uh, for instance, maybe uh, you use accessibility affordances uh, without thinking about them, or they make your life easier in ways that you don't think about. Um, so, I mean, I'm sure... Uh, I mean, raise your hand how many people have had luggage that has wheels that you pull or like have pushed a baby carriage. I mean, I think that's everyone. Um, uh, I'm sure you've, you've seen one of these things. This is a curb cut. Uh, essentially, um, you know, it's a ramp that lets you go up onto the sidewalk. And these are so common now that we don't think about them. But really, these didn't exist. Uh, except for a few specific places until the 60s or the 70s, and still there are some places that are adding them. Um, and this is something that makes our life easier every day. We don't think about it anymore. Um, and we have disability advocates in the 1960s to thank for this, because in Berkeley they went around with sledgehammers and added these um, on their own. <laughs> and now they're everywhere, and everyone loves them. Uh, so this is uh, known as the curb cut effect, basically the idea that disability, th these affordances can offer us, offer things to, um, to everyone. Uh, in addition, uh, there's a really um, famous graphic uh, from 
that Microsoft produced, which I've included here, which explains this idea that um, not even things that are permanent, but also things that are temporary, or even in just like a particular situation, can lead us to being excluded. Uh, for instance, um, if you've broken your arm, uh, maybe you you can't use things that require two hands, or if you're holding a baby. I mean, these are the kind of the kind of situations where having uh, accessibility technology can be really helpful. Uh, another example is if you uh, speak uh, a variety of English like me, and you have difficulty understanding other accents, uh, closed captioning can be very helpful. I mean, these are <laughs> things that we use every day that we don't think about, but um, really they started out as accessibility technologies. Um, so, and if none of that convinces you, then you should know that accessibility more and more is the law. And uh, maybe you saw this, uh, this, um, this is a few days old. Basically, the US Supreme Court said that, you know, that uh, Domino's Pizza could not avoid being sued for having an inaccessible website. Um, so basically, if you produce web content, more and more, if that content is not accessible, you could be liable for large fines um, or whatever. So money is a big motivator. So if the other things didn't convince you, uh, I'm sure this will. So uh, anyway, that's just an introduction to kind of motivate why this is important. Um, so oops, it's really big here. Um, so. When we're talking about web browsers, what kind of uh, what kind of assistive technologies are we talking about? Um, there's just like a list of some common things. Uh, probably the, like the most common thing that we think about is a screen reader, which is just software that uh, takes the text of a web page and reads it, or maybe describes um, the content a bit. And if you have a, at least if you have Linux or a Mac, you should have a built-in screen reader. You could turn it on in your settings and and hear what it's like to use one. Uh, but there are other things like Braille displays that can produce Braille, um, or on-screen keyboards, uh, magnifiers, uh, and uh, debug inspectors, uh, which is uh, an assistive technology that uh, people implementing accessibility use to, uh, to make sure everything is working. Um, uh, and just a very quick overview of what the architecture of this looks like. Typically, on one side you have your web browser, and almost always there's a process boundary, and some accessibility APIs that span that process boundary and interact with the assistive technology. And the arrows point in both directions because there are queries that can be made, or commands that can be made from the assistive technology to the web browser, and there are, there's also a command flow. Uh, or information flow like to the assistive technology. Um, so it's a two-way thing. Um, and inside the web browser, typically what you have is you have the layout tree or the flow tree, whatever you call it in your browser. Um, and then typically speaking, there's another tree, which is the accessibility tree, which is a transformation of the layout tree. Um, into a tree that's useful for interacting with accessibility assistive technologies. Uh, and typically what happens is this accessibility tree is hooked in in some way to the platform accessibility APIs. Um, so I this is all well and good, but what does this look like? Um, essentially, uh, when we think about the data flow going from the assistive technology to the web browser, the kind of things that uh, we might be, the assistive technology might be asking about are the structure of the tree. You know, what are the parents? What are the children? Um, what is the relationship between the different objects? Uh, and these would be objects on the page. Uh, divs. Uh, the mapping is not one to one, but it, it's got a very similar shape. Uh, also, the dimensions of of the objects on the page, which means that obviously it's um, it, it also includes maybe information from the pending phase, or it, it, it's not exactly just the layout tree. Um, and their positions. 
Also this idea of uh, the role of accessibility objects, which sort of, there's this conceptual issue when we're dealing with uh, assistive technology where the technology really wants to know like, not just what the thing is, but why it's there, which makes it easier for the technology to, to interact with that and explain it to the, to the user of the assistive technology. Um, and this role goes toward answering that question. It doesn't always answer the question, but um, it's useful. And the web browser typically has a mapping from different page objects to different roles. Um, I'm explicitly not talking about ARIA here, but that also hooks into this and adds information to this as well. Uh, other things are properties of node, font, color of the color of the text, all these kind of things. And the text content of the node, uh, which is obviously useful for a screen reader or a braille display for reading it. Uh, and then furthermore, like cursor and selection information, which uh, can be useful for moving, uh, knowing where the, where the focus is or where the text will be inserted when you insert it. Uh, and also the structure of tables. Uh, it's pretty important when uh, reading a web page. In addition, uh, the assistive technology um, might want to send basically what you could think of as actions to the browser. Um, and these are things that, um, so oftentimes when you're using the assistive technology, the, the other forms of input still still apply, like you can still, for instance, use the keyboard when you're using a screen reader, and keyboard interaction with the page is similar to how you, if the screen reader was turned off. So these things can often, more often sit on top of normal interaction. Um, and uh, some of the things that can happen here are activating links uh, or other inter interface elements, um, going through menus, selecting things, activating menu options, or selecting and selecting them, um, changing the position of the, I said cursor, but I mean like the carrot, the text cursor, moving the text cursor different places, um, and also selecting things, unselecting them, things that would be difficult to do um, if you didn't have like access to a mouse, for instance. Um, scrolling the browser window or like making sure that elements are scrolled into view, another big thing. And, and here, maybe you're starting to see like why accessibility uh, maybe can cause crashes that you otherwise wouldn't have because you imagine that on the other side of this process boundary, you have handles on objects which in some way have DOM objects behind them. Um, and this tech, this software can do everything an editor can do, everything the editing code in a web browser can do at any time. Uh, so like if there's like a dead node on the other side, maybe it's poking the node. And this is why like assistive technology stresses this part of the web platform in a way that like maybe developers aren't thinking of. So um, you start having to think about timing issues and dead objects and objects that have already been free but not cleaned up, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And finally, this is something specific to Chromium, but I, I just wanted to explain it because I think it's interesting to, uh, to explain the next session, which, section, which are events that, uh, that can be triggered from the browser that touch the assistive technology. So essentially the way this works in Chromium is the page changes, and you had an old accessibility tree and a new one. Uh, what Chromium does is it takes the two trees, it, com it compares them, and it, from that comparison, it says like, oh, like, uh, your children changed, or you're the same node, but you know, you have different text now. And from that comparison, it generates events. Uh, the content of my text changed, uh, my children changed, my position moved, that kind of stuff. Um, and then those events are sent to the uh, to the platform APIs. And I mean, some of the things are I said some, but other ones are, you know, the focus a different node is focused, uh, the a different window is activated. Um, some of these don't necessarily come from the tree comparison, but come from outside. So it's kind of a combination. 
uh, parent and children change, the properties of a node change, this kind of things. And these all are sent as signals to the assistive technology. Um, so anyway, that's basically a really basic, quick intro to platform accessibility. And just to finish up, uh, to go quickly over what we're doing, if anyone's interested in the Linux desktop <laughs> side of this, is that uh, we're implementing this uh, for Chromium and ATK. Uh, traditionally, on the Linux desktop, Chromium uses a software called Chromevox, which is a uh, what I understand a very nice screen reader, but it's uh, different from the native screen reader that uh, people might be used to when using the Linux desktop. So this adds a, a deeper set of native interaction. Um, and essentially the work involves connecting a lot of the pre-existing Chromium code to these platform APIs. Um, and <laughs> to go into the, some of these nitty gritty details of Linux platform APIs, there are at least two pieces. Uh, one piece is the uh, library called ATK, which is the um, sits on the the web browser side. We kind of in reverse of the naming conventions, the the client application is called a server because it's serving its accessibility tree to a client, which is the assistive technology. And then sitting on the client side, so for instance, with a screen reader, is uh, ATSBI2. These have like a mirrored interface that are almost exactly the same, but not quite. Um, and then uh, finally, one piece uh, is mapping the accessibility roles inside the web browser to the set of platform accessibility roles, which are not one-to-one. -one. Uh, so basically a cross-platform set of roles to a to a set of platform-specific roles. And this is actually specified. There's a spec, if you click on it, uh, that lists for the major screen readers what, uh, for instance, an ARIA role is in on the platform and like how it should behave, um, which is, I feel like, much deeper than most specifications go on platform-specific specific behavior. So uh, yeah, finally, um, this is almost done. I mean, we're finishing up some of the bugs now, so this should be active in an upcoming Chromium release. Probably not the next one, but maybe the one or the one after that. Okay, that's it for me. If anyone has any questions, I can try to answer them. Uh, so it's good. I, uh, uh, the installation before was that it was not working at all. Uh, it, you could use Chromevox to to um, to uh, have a screen reader, screen reader for Chromium, but my understanding is it didn't work with later versions of Chrome, or there was some issue where it wasn't quite exactly how it should be. So this is a a better experience for for uh, Linux users, Linux desktop users. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So does the Chromium accessibility tree map, like is, is it completely, completely a transformation of the layout tree or does it also account for other DOM bits? It's different in at least one way. I'm sure there's more. Pseudo content has its own accessibility node. Like, but that appears on the layout. Ah, uh, does it? Do they have their own? Okay. Uh, I, I was thinking more about stuff like display contents, that kind of thing that doesn't generate layout boxes, but do. Uh, I'm not sure about dis not sure about display contents. Yeah, that's a new CSS CSS feature, right? <laughs> 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 I'd have to like I have to go in and just look at look at how that works. Should be the result. The result of what? So you're so you're talking about how like display contents 
does an does actual draw the box. And how many, there's no box. It, it's not like they don't draw, it's, it's, there's no box. Okay, but since we're calling like, the box through them, it's not what, a what you would think would be it. There's okay. nothing there. That's exactly what I'm saying. I don't know what you're going to say. Okay. <laughs> right. So that should, the connection should be there. Right. But my point is that the big one does may still have some semantic. Yeah, that, that element needs to be in the accessibility tree, even though it's not <coughs> on the that's a major bug, and it's oh, okay. uh, well, I didn't, right. it's, I didn't it's been know. a major problem for people trying to navigate sites that use the content. Right. It's the fact that it is not an interesting issue. Is this a What? Sorry. I think it's been partially fixed or fully fixed in some of but I'm not sure. Uh, it was fixed. Um, yeah, and, uh, I, mean, I don't I think it's a result, but I don't know. Yes. Yeah, that was the question. I don't know. I mean, I I don't know the answer, but I can say that uh, these sort of bits of CSS do cause major issues for accessibility technologies. For instance, um, pseudo content is a huge a huge issue. The the behavior is really inconsistent because it does show up. I mean, you have issues like it. It does show up in the accessibility tree. Um, but when you select it, it doesn't show up in the visual selection or in the copy paste, but it does show up in the selected text as far as the accessibility tree is concerned. Um, so like, essentially, it's probably fine as long as the author is not doing anything too weird, but the author could easily the, the break. Generated content is supposed, it should be highlighted and it should be showing up the copy paste but it's, but it's not acceptable. But it, like, I know, but right, yeah. So basically it's like the implementation is like in a weird di different state. And, so that, that's yeah. an example of like where you want to see information from the box tree that's not in the element tree. And then we have other cases where you want information from the element tree that's not in the box tree. And right. so like depending on what exactly you're doing and what you're looking at, yeah. it varies a little bit. All that to say that like places where uh, where some things some cans have been kicked down the road in CSS, like they become very important, uh, like very pertinent for accessibility implementations pretty quick. So, but yeah, hopefully you're not. Writing novels in CSS content. <laughs> I think another issue is that some of the limitations you use table display, and it feels like they display, like it, you can't navigate a table that's been displayed to something else as a table. Uh -huh. That even if like, somebody's trying to form that information just for layout purposes to like a grid, for example, then you lose the ability to navigate the table as a table. For that's not good either, so. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, no, I mean, it's a really kind of painful, as an, an implementer, just, you know, doing plumbing, it comes up. Uh, any other questions? Great. Well, thank you very much.